Great, thanks, Chris. Um, so, well, firstly, it's very exciting to be in Vancouver. I haven't been back here in 20 years, and I'm originally French Canadian. So, um, hopefully, all those Canadians out in the audience, I can uh, shed a little bit of light, and you won't fall asleep uh, due to that post-lunch uh, kind of uh, creeping up on you. Um, so, actually, I've done this presentation a couple of times before, so there might be a few people in the audience who have seen it. So um, I have updated it a little bit, and um, before I'm going to get into it, I, I just want to uh, probably caveat a couple of things. So institutional investors, I'm really referring in this presentation to venture capital firms um, or large publishers. So that's the definition of institutions, and really the fundraising size, um, because of those large organizations, you're looking at fundraising's kind of minimum of around you know a couple of million, up, well up to thirty million dollars, um, or, or plus in some cases. Um, I've in the past this has been uh, European focused, and so I wanted to keep it European focused because I haven't focused too much on Canada. But actually, in the panel we'll have immediately after this, uh, we're going to get a lot of interesting can, uh, Canadian insights from a Canadian panel. Um, so let's just dive in. Uh, so very little, about, you know, kind of intro on uh, who Agnisio Capital is. We're a uh, games-focused investment bank. We were founded in 2003 in London. Um, we've done quite a few transactions in the space. Um, you know, you can go to our website uh, to get a lot more information. Um, Probably some a few a couple of deals I'll just very quickly highlight um, was one of the transactions we we raised a Series A investment um, for a Vienna-based studio called Social Spiel from Nexon, uh, and uh, we also sold um, a very very successful mobile free-to-play business based in London called Future Games of London. Uh, you might recall that they were the developers of Hungry Shark Evolution and Hungry Shark World which is now published by Ubisoft. Um, so uh, we also advise, and well, I should say invest, um, which is really myself personally leading angel syndicates. Um, and so I've personally invested into studios such as Funky Panda, which is a London-based mobile free-to-play studio, some ex-Playfish uh, uh, senior, senior uh, staff, uh, Social Spiel as well, which I mentioned, uh, Hutch Games, which uh, is a developer of MMX Hill Climb, as, um, as well as a number of other racing titles, uh, which is also based in London, and then Gungeon Games, which is based in Brighton, uh, which is another uh, gaming hub in the UK. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, the market, because this is going to actually frame um, the discussion later on and the implications on fundraising in the current market. So everybody knows the market's huge. Um, this is actually some figures from Super Data Research. Uh, this is a worldwide figure. Um, so obviously 2015 was a phenomenal year. 2016 is, is looking to be uh, probably 10 to 20 percent uh, uh, growth on 2015. What is interesting to note also during this time, let's say this year, China is now the biggest mobile gaming market, uh, followed closely by the U.S. Uh, and Japan, and then, you know, um, in fourth place, South Korea. Um, I've done this now a number of times, and um, it gets even more and more interesting each time I do this. So this is the analysis of the top 100 grossing chart position under the games category for iOS in the US. Um, and, and the reason why I do this, and I've done it sort of in six month increments, and the first time I did this was actually a couple of years ago. Um, and, 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 and the rationale or the reason for doing this is the U.S. is the largest market uh, um, in the Western world. And we're in Canada, so you know, we're sort of their, their, their northern neighbor. Um, it's, 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 this country always is kind of a test bed uh, for, uh, to some degree, what might succeed in the U.S. and then ultimately other Western uh, uh, countries. And the reason is, I think in the U.S., it's such a diverse mix of cultures, ethnicities, languages, et cetera. So it really gives you kind of a really broad base of, of preference, um, and also then ultimately in terms of games. Um, so what is interesting, and I remember when I did this, this chart, this analysis a couple of years ago, uh, at that time it was about 80% of, of the uh, titles 
in the top 100 grossing were free to play and now it's 99. So here's a little pop, qu pop quiz. There's one title in the previous slide that's a premium title. Can anybody tell me what that title is? Okay, you guys are all gamers. That's good. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> it was a giveaway. It was a giveaway. I was just making sure you were, you were still awake. Um, so the majority of these titles were developed by U.S. studios. Um, what is interesting is obviously you have some pretty, you know, decent uh, uh, presence from European uh, uh, countries. So Sweden uh, had about nine titles, uh, eight of them from King, one from Minecraft. Uh, Finland, obviously, everybody knows how successful Supercell is. They have four titles now. Given the introduction of Clash Royale, they had consistently three for the past couple of years. Uh, Rovio has obviously performed well. Uh, they have a couple of charts that were in the top 100 to top 200 that have now kind of creeped up given the success of um, the, the recent film release. Um, and you have Seriously, actually, um, which, which uh, uh, their best fiends titled can, continues to perform well. And then some other notable countries. So you have Japanese developers, actually, who've developed a lot of their, you know, kind of Japanese RPG-style games, the uh, uh, D DNA, um, as well as a few others um, that, that fare well in the charts. And then, of course, you have a lot of the casino games that companies like Playtica, and then also some more hardcore uh, titles from Plarium um, featuring in, in that top 100 grossing title. Um, another really, really important point um, is the larger players are starting to have more and more titles in that top 100 grossing. So King has eight titles, EA has seven, Zynga has five, Supercell and Playtica have four. And there's also multiple other studios such as Scopely, SGN, GSN that have you know, two, three titles. So it's, it's, it's becoming an ever, ever, ever crowded market dominated by fewer and fewer people and also concentrated in fewer, fewer geographies or countries that are impacting that top 100 grossing chart. Um, also important, also related to this, um, is the effect of measuring the, the, the cost per lo loyal user index, um, or you know, effectively another measure of CPI. Um, so this is really defined as somebody that'll open up their title three times within a specific month. Um, and it continues to grow. Uh, unfortunately, the only most recent figures we could, we, I, could, I could search up from Fixu was, was uh, towards the end of last year, uh, but it has not changed much. In fact, everything that I've heard and a lot of the research I've read uh, indicates that this continues to go up. Um, so, and, and this, is, this is an average, right? So if you, if you actually look at hardcore titles or you know, RPG titles, strategy, game, strategy titles, they continue to just creep up. So what's a summary? Um, the market is really, really competitive. I mean, um, you know, I remember when I did this presentation probably the first time a year and a half, two years ago, um, all of these points were relevant then, but they're even ever so more re relevant now. So fewer and fewer players dominating the industry, um, those fewer players being able to um, crowd out smaller players. Um, before, I remember when I'd look at uh, um, companies I might want to advise and I'd say, hey, well, you know, what's your pitch? How are you going to sell this to, to an investor? And they would tell me, well, you know, we want to, we want to get into the top 50 grossing. This is two years ago. Then last year, oh, well, we, we think we got a title that can make it to the top 100 grossing. So if you're going to tell me today that you're going to make it to the top 100 grossing, this chart back here, that's an incredible achievement. Absolutely incredible achievement. I would rate your probability probably lower than winning the lottery. So I'm not trying to be the, the, the bearer of bad news or a doomsday you know, painter here, but um, it's a very, very, very difficult market out there. So if you're going to aim for a top 300, that's already a pretty impressive achievement if you ask me. Even top 500, I think you got, I think you got legs. I, got, I think so. I think it's a matter of setting your expectations. And then also, if you're going to be pitching investors, particularly institutional investors, who have the prowess, who have the financial resource, who have access to app any intelligence, who know exactly what every other large title is making by geography, you better do your own research. And you better have a pitch that resonates with them. And, and they can, can look you in the eye and say, OK, you know what? I really believe these guys. I actually think they're onto something. And they've done their market research. They've done their homework. They've come to me, and they've seen what kind of other companies I've invested in. And so therefore, 
I think they actually have a chance of hitting that maybe top 400 and maybe top 500. And if they're lucky, and if they're hardworking, and if they understand live ops and UA and BI, then maybe they could actually continue to, 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 to push themselves up into maybe top 300, top 200 territory. And then if they combine forces with a major publisher, well then, you can maybe get into the top, top 100 or higher. Um, the last point on this that I'm going to touch upon in this slide is, is consolidation. So certainly what, what, what we've been seeing is in the current market, consolidation at the lower end. So either uh, studios that are being acquired as aqua hires, talent acquisitions, um, or even smaller profitable studios um, that are, that, that, you know, that let's say a slightly larger player, a mid-sized player, uh, would find attractive as a nice little bolt-on acquisition to give them product diversification. Maybe they're developing games in a genre that that particular publisher wants to get into, uh, but but doesn't have uh, um, a, a legitimate internal development capability. Um, so yeah, I think that certainly this year, um, that consolidation at the lower end will continue to accelerate. Um, and potentially at the higher end. But in that mid-tier region, that's what's really interesting to me is, I don't know what's gonna happen. And I'm not gonna name names of mid-tier players, we all know who those are. Um, but in my opinion, those mid-tier players, they re they're the ones who are gonna have the most difficulty in this market right now. So either they're gonna have to find a way to get themselves to a position of being a leading publisher and join a sort of that tier one, uh, um, I guess, universe of, of, of publishers which which is few. Um, and so either they're going to have to do that by raising tons of money from huge growth equity investors or doing acquisitions or going public, which are all, again, very difficult to do in the Western world at the current mark in the current market. So again, now that I've sort of at least given a little bit of a, a summary of the current market environment, um, which is, which is, again, not overwhelmingly in favor or, or auspicious for emerging studios trying to raise money. Um, I'm just going to dive in to uh, some European game sector fundraisings. So again, these were institutional fundraisings. Uh, some of you in the audience have seen this slide before. So um, this was in the calendar year of 2015. And again, as you all know, what's really interesting, I'm sure you've read about it in GamesBeat, GamesIndustry.biz, or Pocket Gamer as well, the amount of fundraisings that a small country with a population of 5 million in, in Scandinavia, uh, I should say Nordics actually, not Scandinavia, Nordics, that, that continues to lead the pack. And they had eight fundraisings out of 24 um, in 2015, followed closely by the UK at seven, and then Germany at three. So you guys have seen those numbers. This is the first half of this year. Doesn't look very promising, does it? So Finland and the UK, again, saw two fundraisings each. Um, there was one deal in, in, in Germany, one deal in Holland. Um, so I, th I think everybody knows, including, including North America, investment activity is down. VCs are definitely retrenching. Publishers are retrenching. Um, in the first half of 2015, there was eight institutional fundraisings announced in Europe um, and six thus far. Now, I've spoken to a lot of studios, in fact, well-positioned studios, auspicious studios, studios that have product out, that are making money, and asking them, hey, you know, what's, what's the current market you know, outlook for you guys? What's, what's, what's it like? You guys are out fundraising. What's, what, are you, what are you seeing? And so um, a lot of them are saying, well, if we're missing particular people in, 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 in our you know, top sort of senior management team, that, that seems to be a problem and a hole that we need to fill. Or, we, you know, we have maybe a title out, but um, we're just not, you know, the LTVs are just not there to support ongoing UA activities. So, so a lot of the investors are, are offering good advice back to them, but they're continuing, they're, they're not, let's put it this way, the sentiment is not overwhelmingly positive. Um, what I will say in that final point is, VCs and publishers still have a ton of money. And they still remain incredibly excited um, and, see, and know the potential of, of um, the mobile gaming industry. But they continue to be more and more selective. Not because they want to be, but because the market is dictating it. 
So based upon what I said in the previous slides and where we are today, they have to also look at it, not necessarily from a, well, you know, the market is so ripe, the market continues to grow in absolute terms, but actually, well, we have to be selective. Um, so again, I mean, I, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know. I mean, why is Finland successful? Well, hey, it's, it's got fantastic mobile gaming talent. Um, everybody in Finland, especially in, in a hub of Helsinki, speaks to each other. They're incredibly transparent. Um, they benefit from this, you know, this, this sort of unique, very closely knit community. Um, and so that's why I think it spurned so many interesting studios. And that's why you've also had three VCs in the Nordics that continue to fund and invest. Not, not sporadically, not selectively, not saying, hey, this is my one, you know, I've checked off my one gaming investment in my portfolio and that's that. No, they continue to invest, they continue to support um, the Finnish gaming space. And those three are Creandum, uh, uh, Sunstone, and uh, North Zone. Um, you also have in the UK, you know, uh, uh, investors such as Initial and Index, and they continue to support not just UK studios, but also uh, um, throughout Europe. Uh, Germany has, has an interesting hub of what I'd like to say platform, analytics, UA, marketing companies, um, companies such as Adjust that I'm sure everybody knows in, in this room, um, AppLift as well, you know, so those kinds of companies have, have really kind of made a name for themselves in Germany. Um, most of the companies were involved in some part of the value chain of developing, launching, marketing, mobile games. Um, majority of the fundraisings in the last 18 months went into get mobile gaming studios. Uh, but again, you're starting to see the rise because of how difficult it is in a, in a content-driven, hit-driven industry. You're seeing a lot more, actually, activity into platform and services and, and businesses, and now VR and AR startups. Um, what is also interesting, there was only one deal in the last 18 months that was done in the online um, or PC gaming space. Average deal size was about $4 million or less. Um, again, only 5 out of 30 uh, deals were done above the $10 million mark. I think I already alluded to some of the funds that are investing. Um, there's only really a handful that I consider long-term committed gaming investors. You know, you get you, I, the three I mentioned and, and, you know, initial index, and then there's kind of a couple who, you know, make a bet, but maybe they'll make a bet once every two years. Um, I've, I've met some of the Canadian VCs as well, such as Van Edge and whatnot. Um, they pretty much share a very similar risk appetite or profile, I would say, to a lot of European VCs. Um, I think also their fund sizes are not as large as some of the European VCs, so they, they tend to write smaller check sizes, and they tend to be a little bit more selective than, than, than some of the funds in Europe. Um, so what does that mean for, for you guys in the audience raising money? Well, there's a funding gap. And that funding gap, uh, certainly in the last couple of years, well, I'd say really in the last three, four years, and where I spend a significant amount of my time in Asia cultivating relationships, is the Asian publishers who are looking to the West to, to bridge that gap. Because of not only the, the insight and the free-to-play expertise that they've, that they've built up over you know, more than a decade, that they can leverage and offer to studios uh, um, in North America and Western Europe. Um, and uh, they've already made a number of deals and a number, a number of bets, and they're only going to continue to do that. But the bar is incredibly high, as I mentioned. Um, and so what are those golden rules that they're looking for? Or what are those criteria? And again, it's, 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 it's nothing new. I mean, you guys all know this. Um, and I can't even emphasize this more, how important having a really best of breed, world class team is. Um, you know, and you should really have an amazing team at every function of your business. And I can't emphasize enough as well that you should really try to incorporate a business commercially driven individual as well. It doesn't even have to have a gaming industry, but somebody that you trust that can negotiate deals on your behalf. A track record is always great. If you already have launched product out there in the market that's generating a decent amount of revenue, great. Or if you're setting up a newer studio, if you worked on a great title previously at one of the large mobile gaming or even online gaming companies, great. Um, all of these, these are all ways to de-risk your proposition to, to potential and institutional investors. Uh, commercial focus, I think I mentioned this already. Um, again, 
um, the more that the more that you can kind of make a game that's going to be appealing to uh, as large of an audience as possible. That's really focused on finding a, a, a very um, attractive, you know, game loop, but at the same time can monetize those users over the long run. Uh, having networking skills, it's, it's really difficult to approach VCs and publishers. So uh, if you have somebody that has done that before, that can network, that can go to all the conferences, um, that can drink with guys like Michael Chang, you know. <laughs> oh, excuse me, he doesn't drink, actually. There's another, there's another pointer for you. Um, so, you know, that, that's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. Um, you got to get out there. You got to get in front of them. You got to establish a relationship. Raising money is something that takes a significant amount of time. And if they don't know you, you can't expect somebody to invest multiple millions of dollars into your studio without meeting them over a significant period of time, establishing credibility, showing them your product, showing them what improvements you've made, um, and having a, a, a certain number of, of intervals or frequencies of, of sharing that information and showing them your competence and building that credibility and trust. I mean, it's, 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 there's no shortcut to that. Um, and again, also having some financial competence and having good advisors, again, that's only going to help you in any process, whether you're negotiating with a VC or, or a uh, publisher, or ultimately you're, go you're going to sell the company. I mean, these are all incredibly valuable, important skills to have. That's it.